taken from St. Luke chapter 3. Now, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother, tetrarch of Eturia, and the country of Lycaconitis, and Asanias, tetrarch of Abilina, under the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert, and he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the, name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. By way of announcement, next, next Saturday is Christmas Eve. There'll be Mass at 8 in the morning in Boston, Kentucky at the seminary. And of course, you're all welcome to come. <clears throat> and then uh, in the evening, there will be Matins, the Divine Office of Matins, the solemn chanting of the Divine Office by the seminarians, which will t start at 8 o'clock on Christmas Eve night. And then that will be three hours long. And then uh, after that, there'll be confessions from 11 to midnight with Christmas carols between. And then every year people call and ask, what time is midnight mass? <laughs> so midnight mass is at midnight. It'll start at 12 a.m with the blessing of the baby Jesus in the crib, and then the great midnight mass. And that's the only mass there will be in Boston, Kentucky, because uh, we're going to be flying out. Father Pfeiffer will be covering other circuits, and I'll be covering the Midwest. Isaiah the prophet said, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said that 730 years before Christ came. Christ did come. God made flesh, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. We have seen His work. Those who were alive with Him saw His eyes, saw His face, saw His miracles, heard His preaching. But we also see Him on His crucifix. We see Him in the Mass by the eyes of faith. And in confession, it's His blood that breaks the chains of the devil that increases grace in the soul. In our baptism, it's He that's poured into our soul. Christ, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, truly dwell in the soul of sancti by sanctifying grace. And all this, this, of course, refers to the two comings of Christ. The first coming in humility and in the cold of Bethlehem and in the, in the meekness of the Lamb who would be humiliated and crucified. That's the first coming. But the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ will be tremendous. When, as the Psalms say, the mountains will melt like wax before Him. His light will shine brighter than the sun. He will come no longer as the meek lamb, but as the real lion of the tribe of Judah, carrying the cross, the trophy, and the wounds of his hands and feet shining, and he will be crowned as king. And all the millions and millions and millions of angels will salute him, bow before him. The ancients cast their golden crowns before him. And even the damned and even the devils of hell, the beasts of hell, will shriek with hatred of Christ, but they will be forced to kneel before him. And we will there, we'll, we'll all be there to see that day when all the human race is gathered before the throne of Jesus Christ the King. Then all history will be made clear. Then all justice will be made, will be done. The old saying of the ancients, justice will be done or the heavens will fall. And we know in this life there's so many people, innocent people who are imprisoned, put to, put to death, 
who are falsely accused, falsely fined, unjustly trampled on. And all this will be made clear on the day of judgment. So the two comings that Christ, that Isaiah refers to. <clears throat> but there's one aspect I'd like to focus on with you, and that is the tremendous love of Christ for the souls. And secondly, what we owe back to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. The Protestants like, like to quote that, but they don't like to follow it. Because to be a follower of Christ, that means we've got to believe all he taught. We don't have the right to pick and choose and say, well, I like baptism, but I don't like the sacrament of confession. And I don't like the Holy Eucharist. I don't believe in the sacrifice of the Mass. We can't do that with the, the Holy Faith. We have to believe like children. All that God has revealed through Scripture and tradition. And that reveals... The Protestants, you know, they, and the Lutherans and all the heretics, they reject this Holy Eucharist. And they talk about the love of God, but their, their love of God is meaningless. Because the love of God really is that excessive. St. Lawrence Justinian says, the, the wisdom of God has become foolish out of an excess of love. And that excess of love was to be butchered from head to foot at the scourging, crowned and mocked with the crown of thorns, carrying the cross, being nailed to the tree, and dying on the cross, and then giving himself in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the same sacrifice as on Calvary. That's who we kneel before. And the living body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ given to you in the Holy Eucharist, this is the tremendous love of God. This is the love of the Sacred Heart. How can you or I diminish that and say, well, I don't accept that. That's too excessive. But the fact is, Christ Himself said, with desire of desire to eat this Pasch with you. And that Pasch is His sacrifice and the sacrifice of the Mass. And He wants to be united to you by Holy Communion. He wants to be burning in your soul by love. And He says also in St. Luke's Gospel, I have a baptism whereby I am to be baptized, and how I am straitened, how I am in great desire until it be accomplished. And what baptism was Christ speaking of? Being baptized in His blood by the sacrifice of the cross. That's the baptism that He so much desired, and it's the expression of His sacred heart, and it's speaking from all eternity. It's an echo from all eternity. This love of Christ, this love of God to save fallen mankind from going eternally to the pool of lava, the pool of fire, the lake of fire, which is hell, the damnation of hell. And, and, and you, you kind of get a glimpse of how serious hell is by how serious Christ took saving us from going there. But he won't force us. And this is the scary part. He died for us. He who, say, who created us without us, who created you without you, said St. Augustine, he won't save you without you. He's not going to save us without us. That is, we have to obey his commandments. We have to love him above all things. We have to really thirst to see the face of God. And that's the hard part. That's the hard part. Well, it shouldn't be too hard, really, because as St. John Chrysostom says, God who gave, when, he, when someone loves, they, ex they often expect to be loved back. And God who loved us to give everything, He really wants to be loved back. And that love we owe to Him. And not, even if He didn't go through all the passion and death, we would still owe him perfect love and obedience. But now none of us have any excuse. And St. Uh, John Chrysostom also says, he says that if Christ came down on earth, poked his finger, squeezed out one drop of blood, 
That's all that was needed for the redemption of the whole human race. That's it. But what was sufficient for our redemption, says St. John Chrysostom, was not sufficient for Christ's love. Because he knew most human race would say, oh, well, all he did was prick his finger and spill out a little blood, so what's the big deal about that? So he accept, he embraced the most violent death, the most audiovisual, full-color death in blood and humiliation in order to move us to love him back in return. So the answer is quite simple. What St. Augustine used to say, Lord, you love me so that you gave your whole life for me. So the most normal thing is we give everything back to him. And we're supposed to. Oh, but I'm not a priest. I don't have to do that. Well, yes, you do, because you've got an intellect and will, and you may not be a priest, but you still must love God above all things. Yeah, but I'm married. Yeah, but you must love your husband or wife and your children in God, who gave them to you on loan. And you've got to help your wife get to heaven and your children. You've got to get your, help your husband get to heaven and your children. Oh, but I'm just a kid. I'm not grown up yet. But you still must love God with all your heart. <clears throat> and as soon as you have the use of reason, we must love God with all our heart and mind. And how many children saints there are? Children. Little children. Five, six, seven years old. Who, who died heroic deaths out of love for God. And even martyrdoms. Cruel martyrdoms. Being tortured and crucified like little nine-year-old Saint Simon of Trent. They tried to get him to, a, to reject Christ and blaspheme Christ. He would not, and it was Good Friday in Spain, <coughs> excuse me, in Italy, Trent. But they did this often in Spain as well. And this little Saint Simon, nine years old, they crucified him, the Jews, on Good Friday to mock our Lord Jesus Christ. They crucified him on Good Friday and stabbed him to death. A nine-year-old boy, and he died heroic. And he's a saint, canonized, Saint Simon of Trent. So we, we must love our Lord. And by loving him, we mean, that means also we must, we've got to do many little things a day. Those who love each other, you know, a couple that's, that's going to get married, and they really love each other madly, Right? Do you think they go a day without thinking of each other? No. Now with cell phones, they're always talking to each other, texting. And as soon as he's off of work, what does he do? He calls his babe. And what does she do? She thinks of him. And they try to meet. And they meet with the family, which is a normal way to do it. You don't go off alone, of course, when we're engaged, or even engaged or courting. But the point is, when you love someone, you think of them all the time. And that's how we have to treat our Lord. In all our duties and all our occupations, give the glory to God. But we need to make extra special time. St. Alphonsus says 15 minutes a day of meditation. So does St. Teresa of Avila. And she said, I know that if I have 15 minutes minute, minute, minute meditation a day, the devil will never get a grip on me. He can't. Because uh, you, get, you, get, you stay focused. So try to keep something like that. 15 minutes, half an hour. And in the monasteries, it's an hour in the morning, an hour in the night. And in certain religious orders. So, and of course, to love our Lord, we must also fight for Him. The true proof of someone loving someone is you're going to fight to the death to defend them. A soldier will give his life to defend his country when there's a just war. And he has a duty to do that out of love for his fatherland and for the love of God. That's a noble thing. Everybody recognizes that. The, the no, noble side of the soldier. I say in a just war, and most modern wars are not just, but in a just war, it's a heroic and good thing to do. And uh, also, of course, a husband he must defend his family. Someone breaks in, out comes the rifle. doesn't matter. If that guy's got a rifle, you have, in God's eyes, you have a duty and every right to defend your home from an unjust aggressor. So, 
when we see our Lord Jesus Christ attacked, when we see him crucified, spit on by his popes, spit on by his bishops and his priests, and many religious and most Catholics walking away from him, and when we see documents put out that crucify him with new doctrines and new heresies called Vatican Council II, and signed on by, sad to say, now the leaders of tradition, Bishop Fillet, uh, everyone wants to try to forget this, but the fact still stands. He signed on to accepting Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, the new mass, the new profession of faith, the new code of canon law. This is a real betrayal to our Lord. And that's why the priests of the resistance have a duty to rise up to defend the, the Catholic faith. And that's, that's our duty. So let me just read to you a great lion of the church who died in 1991, Archbishop Lefebvre. And he was the only bishop out of all the 2,500-something bishops of the world. Only two bishops of the Catholic Church stood up to defend the honor of the Holy Faith and our Lord Jesus Christ. Bishop Lefebvre and Bishop de Castomere. And Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated the four bishops. Their duty was to defend the faith, hold the line, until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. But now they're crumbling. They're all crumbling. So what do we do? Well, this is, that's God's problem. We just have to be faithful. And God won't abandon His church. And we, uh, we acknowledge and pray for Pope Francis, but he's destroying the church. We aren't said of Icantus, just like Christ stood before Annas and Caiaphas. These were rotten apostates, these men. But they were high priests, and Christ respected that. Solomon, Solomon built the temple to God. He was a good man at start. But when he started getting married to girls who were... Um, given to false worship, pagan worship, he lost the faith and he started building temples to the false gods. So did he stop being king when he was a bad king? No. Solomon was king to the day he died and he was judged at his death as king. And I, In fact, some of the saints are very doubtful of his salvation because there's not many good signs of a happy death. So let me just read this. This was in 1986. This was a declaration sent all over the world and to the Pope by the great Archbishop Lefebvre and Bishop de Castromare. And uh, this used to be done by the Society of St. Pius X all the time. But now all this is being hushed also in order to get this so-called agreement with Rome and so-called recognition from these modernists. But here's our fight. This is it. It hasn't changed one inch. Listen to this. Following the events of Pope John Paul II's visit to the synagogue and the Congress of Religion at Assisi in Rome, Rome has, in, in Italy, Rome has asked us if we have the intention of proclaiming our rupture with the Vatican on the occasion of the Congress of Assisi. So this is when Pope John Paul II gathered together all the world religions, Buddhists, animists, you name it, they were there. And they burnt incense to the devil on a Catholic altar in the church of, in, in Assisi. We think that the question should rather be the following. Do you believe, and do you have the intention of proclaiming that the Congress of Assisi consummates the rupture of the Roman authorities with the Catholic Church? For this is the question which preoccupies those who still remain Catholic. Indeed, it is clear that since the Second Vatican Council, the Pope and the bishops are making more and more of a clear departure from their predecessors. <laughs> so you see, it's very clear. Who's breaking with the Catholic faith? These modernist popes. And even John, Pope John Paul II, who they say is a saint. Uh, everything that had been put into place by the Church in past centuries to defend the faith, and everything that was done by the missionaries to spread it, even to the point of martyrdom, henceforth is considered to be a fault which the Church must confess and ask pardon for. The attitude of the eleven popes, who from 1789, French Revolution, until 1958, condemned the liberal revolution in official documents, 
It is considered as a lack of understanding of the Christian spirit that inspired the revolution. So they mock the popes of tradition. Hence the complete about-face of Rome since the Second Vatican Council, which makes us repeat the words of our Lord to those who came to arrest him. This is your hour and the power of darkness. Adopting the liberal religion of Protestantism and of the revolution, the naturalistic principles of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the atheistic liberties of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the principle of human dignity no longer having any relation with truth and moral dignity, the Roman authorities turned their backs on their predecessors, that's all the popes previous, and break with the Catholic Church, and they put themselves at the service of the destroyers of Christianity and of the universal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The present acts of Pope John Paul II, and we could add Pope Benedict XVI, who had an Assisi meeting also, and Pope Francis, who just met with the Lutherans in, in Sweden. And the National Episcopates illustrates, year by year, this radical change of the conception of the faith, the church, the priesthood, the world, and salvation by grace. The high point of this rupture with the previous magisterium of the church took place at Assisi, after the visit to the synagogue, that's when Pope John Paul II prayed with the Jews in Rome, at a synagogue in Rome, a huge scandal. The public sin against the one true God, against the incarnate Word and His Church, makes us shudder with horror. John Paul II encourages the false religions to pray to their false gods, an immeasurable, unprecedented scandal. We might recall here our declaration of November 21st, 1974, which remains more relevant than ever. That's the famous great declaration. We still stand by it. November 21st, 1974. Try to reread that. Meditate on it. And then he concludes, For us, remaining indefectibly attached to the Catholic and Roman Church of all times, we are obliged to take note that this modernist and liberal religion of modern and conciliar Rome is always distancing itself more and more from us who profess the Catholic faith of the eleven popes who all condemn this false religion. The rupture does not come from us, but from Pope Paul VI and John Paul II, who break with their predecessors. This denial of the whole past of the Church by these two popes and the bishops who imitate them is an inconceivable impiety for those who remain Catholic in fidelity to 20 centuries of the same faith. Thus we consider as null everything inspired by the spirit of denial of the past, all the post-conciliar reforms and all the acts of Rome accomplished in this impiety. We count on the grace of God and the support of the Virgin Most Faithful, all the martyrs, all the popes right up to the Council, and all the holy founders and foundresses of contemplative and missionary orders to come to our aid in the renewal of the Church through an integral fidelity to tradition. Buenos Aires, Argentina, December 2nd, 1986. Archbishop Lefebvre, Bishop de Castro Mayor. <coughs> Two bishops who did their duty. And now, things are not better. Things are much worse now. This is 2016. Rome has really lost the faith, and we have a pope swinging the sledgehammer, smashing everything left. So, what do we do? Well, we have to be the Maccabees of our day. We've got to rise up with the weapons of the faith, of prayer, of response to Our Lady's request at Fatima, and of Catholic tradition, and keep the Catholic faith. And that's it. We don't compromise it. We don't accept Vatican II. We don't accept the new Mass. We don't play games with the faith. We've got to fight on. And that's, it's for us to carry on fighting, humbly trusting in, in God and the Blessed Mother. And he will see to a good pope. He will see to at last a pope who will finally consecrate Russia. He will see to the restoration of the Catholic Church by good priests, by monks and nuns, by good Catholic and large Catholic families. So pray for our seminarians. We have eight of them studying, one brother. There should be more, but all right, we take what God sends. And uh, they're, they're fine young men, they're studying, and they're, uh, they're in the, you know, they're willing, they understand this battle. And the church depends on future priests, so do pray for them.
to persevere. It's a tough battle. And we are in the war time of war, so the, the training for the priesthood is, Archbishop Lefebvre shortened it to six years with the bare essentials, the bare minimum weapons and ammo to go out and fight. And bring, take care of the souls. Bring them sacraments, confession, the true mass, the true doctrine, and to continue the battle against the destruction of our holy faith. So pray for these boys, and I pray for all the priests as well. And all of you, uh, you know, you who are married, be generous with God. Take the children He sends you. It might be your 20th child that becomes a, a priest, that becomes a bishop, that becomes maybe a pope that will restore the church in future times, maybe under, under the Antichrist. You might have among your girls a mother of saints and a, a foundress of sisters. Who knows? You all know that drawing showing these Yale or Harvard professors and they're mocking God saying, how come you never send a cure for cancer? And the response from God is, I did, but you aborted them. So, take the children God sends, and God will bless you. We have to rebuild while everybody else is destroying. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. Mary conceived without sin. Mary conceived without sin. Mary in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.